How's it going, everyone? Kevin here with Roll On Gaming, and we have a very special guest on the channel this time around. Joining us from Fantasy Flight Games, it is a game designer for Star Wars Unlimited. We are thrilled to be joined by the great MJ Cuts. MJ, thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, it's exciting. Thanks for having me. I haven't done one of these in a minute. Well, you know, <laughs> it's funny you say that because because I've actually been uh, hoping to get the chance to talk to you since your first uh, stream on the FFG Live uh, when you said that you were a massive fan of Knights of the Old Republic 2. And I said, yes. yeah, <laughs> I, I've got to talk to MJ. I know I'd get along with them real well. Yeah, are you a KOTOR 2 fan? Oh, big. Matt, uh, both of the KOTOR games just pure, yeah. pure cinema in game form. I played the second one first because we oh. had the first one, but there was like some problem with our graphics card where it like it had some error and so it, it would crash every time it tried to play the cutscene to leave terrace oh no and so that was my exclusive knowledge of like the first knights of the republic for like years was just there's terrace and other stuff probably happens uh, you must have gotten really good at beating davit kang then because you know that's yeah, the yeah. last place you got before it cut off uh so uh this is obviously release week for twilight of republic uh, really exciting time for all Star Wars Unlimited fans. We got a lot to get to when it comes to set three. But first, I do want to go back to your beginnings at Fantasy Flight Games, which is right around April of last year. Set one in the can. Sets two and three are being worked on. Uh, how has your perception of Star Wars Unlimited evolved from those those early impressions when you first got your hands on the game to what it's become as we approach set three? Yeah, it, it's it's funny, right? Because technically it's like a smaller thing back then, right? There's less cards we had and less people playing the game by a significant amount. Uh, but it was a lot harder to grok because it's all hypothetical, you know? Um, it's always like, like, I haven't worked in a lot of big games. It was definitely the biggest game I'd worked on. But, you know, I was very suspicious or like uncertain of like, is this is this kind of like uh, people talk about um, like Silicon Valley, like self hype is like a thing at companies sometimes of like, when we say this is like, we're trying to make this a big thing. Is this, you know, trying to manifest that, right? Uh, is this actually gonna happen? You know, um, just trying to get a hold of everything and all of the different people that work on it was uh, it was a lot, right? It, it was a lot to kind of all take in. Um, I usually tell people, it's like, I don't think I was completely fully up to speed with understanding how everything worked until almost a year of working on the game because <laughs> there's so, 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 so much. Um, uh, but now that it's out, it's 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 kind of wild because, you know, people people internally were like, you know, we want this game to be big and and then the game, you know, was kind of even bigger than that. Yeah, and and so there's, you know, there's a lot of positivity that's surrounding Star Wars Unlimited. It's been released, it's doing awesome. But now as a designer, you see this game that, you know, you've worked on at varying degrees, you know, when it comes to the design team from inception and then, you know, in, in your case, coming in a little bit later. Now the general public has their hands on Star Wars Unlimited. So you know, as people have been playing it more and more, what are some of the lessons that you and sort of the design team have learned as a result of having a global audience all playing this game that you worked on? Yes, some of it's not even as much, it's like kind of expected, right? Danny would always, you know, ring the, we don't actually know what the meta is going to look like, no matter how confident you are, Bell. He would say that all the time. Um, and in some cases that is true, right? Um, you know, I, I think in in general, you know, trying to have any number of people that isn't the planet, you know, try to evaluate how a game is going to play and how a meta is going to be is, is, you know, it's it's trying to do the best you can with with only so many number of people, right? And And so having all these different people looking at the game from all these different angles, it's really fun to see the things that people find. It's it's surprising to see the things people don't find uh mm -hmm. <laughs> um and you know maybe that will change with time uh I, I know for one a thing that i like 
knew but didn't really think about is like different languages take up different amounts of space in terms of characters on paper right oh uh, sure i remember seeing the i think it was the german cards would be like oh you know because sometimes uh you know designers without uh it's like authors without editors you know if you leave the designers too long on a card uh you'll start asking for a slightly bigger text can we just move the text box up so you can sure. like cram more stuff in it's like don't do that do not do that <laughs> However much you think it is, it's going to be even more for other people. Yeah, absolutely. And so you you did actually mention the the sort of the other thing I want to get into with with sort of these lessons and and you know players playing with your game and all that, and that is the meta game, right? You know, yeah. you, you guys I'm sure did a ton of internal testing, you know, and and with set one stuff, set one and set two stuff, you know, how have those how have those testing sessions? You know, how is that mirrored or not mirrored the way the metagame is shaken out now that we're two sets deep into Star Wars Unlimited? Yeah. Um, uh, I didn't have, like, the most contact with the meta at this point of time. Things were less, I think, what we had expected out the gate. You know, it was, it was a lot of months of kind of, you know, when we saw, like, m people search your feelings for mill cards or whatever. It was like, oh my God, <laughs> I didn't think that this was going to be a thing that was going to be competitive. Uh, things are a lot more in line with kind of what we had been seeing at the time. So that, that bodes well, right? When I talk about uh, we can only test so much for an entire, uh, entire global audience, right? If we're getting some decent sense of things that we had already expected and our you know, like prepared for and and have considerations in mind for like when we make changes for like your two sets based on how we perceive the meta to be, that's kind of dicey, right? Because if your perception is wrong, then these changes could also be doing unintended uh, things. But, you know, right now I, I feel decently confident about our understanding of, of how tournaments are going. Good. Well, that's that's encouraging uh, because we've got, we're going to have a lot more tournaments coming up uh, on our way to the Galactic Championship, uh, which is something that I'm very excited about, and I know a lot of the community is as well. But let's let's talk about the set that's coming out this week, Twilight of the Republic. Uh, by all rights, it's, it looks fantastic. Um, you know, getting a chance to play with it during pre-release weekend, some of the most fun I've had at any pre-release so far in Star Wars Unlimited. Um, and there's, there's some new mechanics that are contributing to that. One of them, which of course being coordinate, uh, coordinate, obviously, which, you know, you get a boost if you have, uh, three or more units on the board, as you know. Uh, but you know, we talk about the metagame, there isn't a ton of that spread out gameplay that's sort of being utilized yeah. so far. So what were some of the challenges that you guys faced in ensuring that coordinate was as consistent, uh, to trigger as you wanted it to be? Yeah, co coordinates like um, it's it's weird in terms of its like value timing compared to exploit because exploit just has this one window that if you can get through that window you get the value and you know uh, aside from potentially getting two for one or something you got the thing right it, it's the difference between a card saying while you have the initiative this card costs one less and while you have the initiative this card gets plus one plus one right mm -hmm. one is a is a gate you have to get through the other is a state you have to maintain um the like array of coordinate bonuses were kind of uh as someone who is mostly looking at limited testing for set three um such a completely different ball game to then looking at like all the stuff we have coming in the future and thinking about how that affects the survivability and durability of coordinate strategies or like the the ability for those things to aggressively take over the board and and keep winning you know um i don't have like the best insight on how tyler had gone at it because a lot of those designs were his from most of the space that we had going into set three but yeah that 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 timing window is definitely a thing that I am cognizant of both with those and also with like future mechanics and kind of looking at set three as a, a heuristic or litmus test of how those timings and and what mechanics are asking of you can really, really change the feel of a thing. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of um, Star Wars Unlimited players are excited that as we get into future sets, you know, how, 
how do these building blocks of mechanics that you guys have constructed um, really interact with with future cards and and things down the road? Um, you know, I'm sure that's true about coordinate as well as exploit. Um, mm -hmm. What were some of the conversations um, similar to coordinate where you were having about exploit about making sure you know this is good for the future, but also good for the present for the three set meta, you know, and making that a consistent thing to utilize as well. Right. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not as certain on the premiere, but you know, the premiere for, for the first year stuff was not something I was able to look at much. So I don't think I can give a great answer. A lot of what I was doing on set three, cause we joined right at the end of, of shadows of the galaxy, like a, a week or two before the end of shadows of the galaxy development um, was kind of, I, I helped a lot with, organizing and expanding our, our limited testing uh, program into something very, very, very comprehensive and beefy, you know, it was, it was a thing that's really important to me. Uh, and it also means that I, I, I don't know. Great. <laughs> I don't know how it applies to the, to the one year meta. Yeah. I can't, I can't talk about anything without thinking about cards that you don't know the names of. Yet. Right. Well, and, and certainly I'm not going to ask you to reveal any of those here. Um, we're, we're spoiling all of set four. On this great, interview. great. Breaking oh, news gosh. into, into roll on gaming. We love to see it. Um, well, I want to spend some time talking about the leaders, uh, of Twilight of the Republic because they're sort of the centerpieces, uh, of Star Wars Unlimited. And of course, this being the Clone Wars era, there are some iconic leaders that we're getting, uh, some that folks are really excited about, um, that are probably going to make an impact on the meta as we know it. Um, there are also some abilities that are really you know, game warping and things that we haven't seen before, like with Chancellor yeah. Palpatine and Darth Sidious. So what made yeah. set three the the right time to sort of introduce and explore this design space with Palpatine? Uh, Palpatine was kind of this no deploy, flipping back and forth design uh, for as long as I ever saw it. And I think it was important to to at least Tyler, if not Danny and Tyler, um, that despite the first set of the game, trying to really uh, have a degree of restraint, right? Like for accessibility and 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 clarity of play, to still show that you know the interesting part of TCGs is looking at all the various parts of a card and saying, what if we turn that into a mechanic, right? Like what if we made that weird? What if we did something to this? And so I, I suspect that the thinking was pretty strongly just in the camp of like, at the end of our first year, this is stuff we can do, right? Like we can we can start to get really weird with, with leader deploys or lack thereof, you know, um, and thematically it obviously just fits really well. Uh, it, it was interesting for a long time, um, Palpatine did not flip back and forth really, like he could, but the idea was more so originally that he, in an Order 66 X fashion, would mostly just switch from uh, Chancellor to Darth Sidious and that the intended play pattern was you would flip that and now you just have like a, a super powerful leader ability, right? And so you kind of mask off and that's that's your, your reward for getting to that position. And we talked a long time about, you know, do we want this to be more of a Clone Wars cartoon, like playing both sides versus a Revenge of the Sith, like he's in one mode and then he's very, very starkly in the next. Um, those were really interesting conversations in relation to, yeah, talking about, you know, both what we want to do thematically and also what we wanted to do with regard to like, this is our first time doing this weird space. And so how do we want to show that weird space, right? How weird do we want it to be? Yeah. Well, it's, it, it seems like a really fun leader to play with. You know, you're going to have access obviously to both heroism and villainy cards, um, and to be able to, to find a balance between those is something that's going to be really interesting for deck builders. Um, mm -hmm. Another leader that's going to be able to play with heroism and villainy cards is Nala Say. Um, the team has already sort of experimented with ignoring aspect penalties with leaders like Hera. So what made Nala Say the next evolution of that concept? Yeah, Nala Say is, is, I think, you know, in a much weirder space than Hera, right? Nala Say is a lot less explicit than Palpatine, but is also her ability is letting you jump across the hero villain line a lot, you know, um, and also has this much broader pool, but at more or less aspects and more or less uniqueness in terms of power level, right? Hera has a pretty clear, like, those are the Spectre cards, play those. Sure. Uh, 
null essay is, is a bit more of a challenge to look at and figure out what to do with. Um, and I think it was important that she did that because we can only do the do X trait, don't care about aspects design so many times, at right. least in, a, in, you know, one year or whatever, before those leaders lose their identity, right? Their personality kind of just becomes, all right, you know, what's the, when, when do we get the rebel one that says skip aspects on rebels and whatnot? Um, I think Nalase's deploy passive of the when defeated ability uh, helps a lot with kind of making it more distinct as well. But yeah, her just being an opportunity to go back to aspect skipping and pay attention to making that aspect skipping feel very different mm -hmm. so that more aspect skippers we do in the future keep that in mind as well was probably the most important part about her. Excellent. Yeah. And of course, Nala say the only uh, Kaminoan leader that we've seen thus far. Um, yeah. So not a super popular uh, trait for leaders, but a, a popular trait for leaders, especially in a set that's designed around the Clone Wars. Uh, obviously, the force trait, the most common trait in all of Twilight of the Republic, more than half of the leaders in the set have the force trait. And they're in all different uh, aspects and colors, which is probably the best part of all of this. So why was uh, expanding and opening up the color pie of force leaders specifically uh, so important to what we're looking towards down the road? Yeah, I, th I think the plan was always to expand it, right? Um, uh, blue is not just the hero light side color, you know, um, the same way that you can have blue villain cards, right? We want those aspects to be flexible. And the force is also a big part of Star Wars um, and can represent itself in a lot of different ways in Star Wars, right? There's like mind tricks versus force lightning. Those are two very different, um, very different tones that kind of demand different aspects to answer. Um, the Clone Wars is a really good space to do that just because we have a lot more force people around. Mm. Uh, they're not dead yet, <laughs> you know, so uh, that kind of stuff is, is I think, kind of baked into the original game plan is, you know, maybe this is a, kind of restricted at first, but that should only keep expanding, right? The idea that any any uh, force trait specificity to an aspect is is going to continue or keep waiting, hopefully should should kind of dispel itself, right, over time as we get more characters and more different, like, parts of those same characters lives you know absolutely and and you know we've already seen uh, a couple different examples of leaders that you know are are in two different colors and and you know so I, i'm excited to continue to see more of that um mm -hmm. you know as it relates to the force leaders you've got them in all different uh cost curves you know you've got the seven costs like the dooku and the yoda all the way down to the four costs and asajj ventress um, there's been a lot of, you know, debate out there about the optimal flip turn for leaders, uh, generally sort of been settled on that five and below, uh, you're feeling pretty good about yourself if you've got, you know, those, those five and below leaders, cause you're getting them out faster, getting to utilize them more quickly. Uh, we know that some five and below leaders are doing a little bit better in the meta game than others. So this may be uh, a little mm -hmm. bit of a loaded question, but, uh, yeah. How have you guys uh, continued to play with, evaluate, however you want to look at it, uh, these these lower uh, deploy leaders uh, as the sets have progressed? Yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely yeah some five deploy and under leaders that that make it harder to evaluate. But in general, I think the power of the five deploy in very polar metas is its ability to play both sides. Right, it's fast enough to get under some control decks but you get just a little bit more to go over uh, a Sabine, right? Something that's kind of just going all out into base every turn. Um, in grindier metas, the five deploy power, I think starts to fade a decent amount. And so the hope is that with like a good curation of metagame and with like a good like, like fluctuation of metas between these more polar uh, very snappy kind of matchups to these grindier uh, value-based games. I think as those things fluctuate, the power of a five deploy versus 
something smaller or bigger will also go up and down, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, and look, there's a ton of leaders to choose from in this set that all look really fun, you know, and, and some of the most iconic leaders are these high cost leaders, the seven, the seven flip ones, like count Dooku, Yoda, Mace Windu. Uh, mm -hmm. What assurance do you have for those players who are, are intimidated by the seven flip that, Hey, you know, still give these leaders a shot, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, like one, the, the, this is like the, this is the hand wavy answer is always like, you can try them in twin sense, you know? <laughs> uh, but beyond that, um, you know, like, A, I really love just some of the fun play patterns with a Yoda or something. I remember Joe once made a surprise Endless Legions deck with Yoda. That, oh my goodness. Uh, it was, yeah. <laughs> playing against a, a double green ramp palpatine that john was playing and you know john played endless legions and we we're like okay game over and then joe was like with nothing on board and like you know very little was like i also have an endless legion <laughs> <laughs> using uh you're my only hope um but yeah again the the hope and expectation is that we're going to flip between those polar and grindy metas more often as the game goes on and that that should help get those leaders like able to survive to that point of the game more often and really see the value of having that bigger body um but also just that the number of like tier one or tier two competitive cards in that like mid cost or high cost space and and critically, cards like that that are that are durable or able to get you to that deploy, your access to those is only going to go up, right? So sure. you know, after set four releases, after set five releases, you know the the options you have, and you know more options that are you know two aspect unique units, which we want to be like the best units in the game. The number of ones you'll have access to in different shells and aspect combinations, I think, makes those seven deploy leaders. Uh, a lot more playable excellent well that's as someone who likes the higher cost uh, leaders i'm very uh, intrigued to hear that but i do i do want to hit you on something you mentioned of course obviously twin sons you're one of the architects of the twin sons format um you know you mentioned that you've done a ton of testing uh in the limited environment um so what excites you the most about introducing these twilight or the republic leaders to twin sons uh, a, bit, a big part of it is I, I'm just, I, I am the age at which Clone Wars era stuff, you know, is uh, exciting. <laughs> you know, uh, the movies I watched as a kid in theaters were the ones where Anakin was the protagonist, you know. Yep. And so being able to have an Anakin leader in Twin Sons that is, you know, exciting and aggressive is something that's really fun for me. I love playing the heel. Uh, I love... Anakin just scaling up in power. He's, he's a surefire way to lose if you're mean to everyone else because you just have this massive leader and everyone's scared. Uh, and it's it's kind of fun to lose that way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I love putting Palpatine in Twin Suns decks for the obvious reasons, you know? It, it's both very fun thematically to imagine, like, which which hero is Palpatine decided to prey on and make his his pseudo apprentice you know you can plug anyone into that second slot and also just from the deck building angle of you can put super laser blast in a hero deck uh, it's cool the possibilities <laughs> the possibilities are there uh yeah. which is great and uh you know that's actually a great segue uh into some some questions that we got from uh, our followers on social media um you know we put a we put a blast out there that we were going to be talking to MJ, you know, and if anybody had any questions uh, to send them in. And we actually got one that's related to Twin Sons uh, from the Golden mm -hmm. Dice podcast, which was, was there a card that you, that originally didn't have any wording that was friendly uh, to Twin Sons that you changed to make it more fun in the format? I don't know if I could, I, I like, I, I've thought about this before and I've looked through, I, I don't know if I remember any in... Twilight of the Republic. I know we definitely came in and were like, hey, these bases are sick in Twin Suns, but they also need to be reworded because it was like your leader gets plus one plus O oh, as opposed to friendly leader units get plus one plus O. Oh. Um, but that was more templating than design. I can definitely think of some cards um, in 
year two where it'd be like, this is, you know, we can change this from an opponent to each opponent every once in a while, stuff sure. like that. Um, people have like once or twice been like, you know, will this be problematic in Twin Sun? And, and I try to not ask those questions too often because my, my hope is that the format is casual and not overly like impactful on the way that we're thinking about cards as we're making them as much as fun surprises that we find after they're made. Um, but it's definitely a thing that's happened a couple of times with sets four through six. Good to know. So we'll keep an eye on, keep an eye on that in the future. Um, there were, there were a couple questions, uh, that were similar to each other in in the sense that both, uh, some Mando and the 503rd Legion, uh, wanted to know about the challenges of designing cards that are both viable, um, in, you know, premiere, uh, and also mm -hmm. thematic and flavorful in a way that you would want a Star Wars character to feel. Yeah, it's there's there's like a lot of different needs pulling on a lot of cards, right? Where the simpler a card is, the less tools you have to tell like a very specific story. And, and that's a good limitation, right? It, it stops you from making the, it's always the joke about like custom TCG cards. It'll be like, you know, if you control an Obi-Wan and a Luke and your opponent controls a Darth Vader right. and, you know, you play this card and this and this, you can just do the whole movie. Um, uh, each of those limitations on their own is good, but you start having to, you know, uh, kill darlings and sacrifice stuff, right? Of this design is too complex or or it's focusing too much on theme over a good play pattern. And so after you go through all those gates, um, it can be really hard to retain the original top-down inspiration for the card. Mm. Uh, the The best that I can do beyond just like, fighting way too hard about it sometimes right. is is that you can often re-inject a lot of theme after all those kind of passes have been made later on in design of like we could just add this keyword or um obi-wan leader had done something different for a while and i remember we we hadn't loved it for the you know the art of him fighting in petronaki arena and and eventually landed on the like heal one deal one is like a this is evoking a blast like deflecting a blaster bolt a little bit right um and finding those little ways to kind of get back to the things we we were most creatively excited by by older messier designs um there are some where though you know where uh i'll i'll want a thing to be strong and also weird and that's always a thing you have to pitch to through the team you know of some really weird big monstrosity with like weird downsides and it's it's super under costed and be like it'd be really cool if this was premier playable and and just met with like crickets <laughs> like i don't know this, this seems like it should be kind of a joke timmy card <laughs> well it sounds it sounds when I think weird, I think Doctor Evazan. So that's sort of where I'm. Yeah, where Doctor I'm Evazan's cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Evazan is is like I, you know, he's a he's a decent aggro threat. He's got a really big downside, but mm -hmm. he does I think really walk perfectly in that middle space. Absolutely, uh, I, I love Evazan so much. I put him in so many decks. I I put him in like every Twin Suns deck I can just for the. Much like Anakin, the excitement of losing spectacularly. <laughs> uh, well, you heard it here first. Put put Doctor Evazan in decks. Um, yes, MJ says so. So so do it. Uh, and mandatory. It's mandatory. Um, you heard it from a designer of the game. Uh, and speaking of designers of the game, uh, our most reacted to question on social media was from one of your fellow designers, John Leo. Uh, who okay. wanted to know what conditioner you use? I don't know if we can even say brands on these. You oh, know what I fair mean? enough. Like, okay. I, don't, I, <laughs> uh, we can we can let you deliver that message internally, perhaps. Yeah, so just, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll just text John. <laughs> yeah, I'll text John like right now because that's good for yeah. for. Uh, yeah, totally. Content. content. We'll just both sit silently for for roughly forty seconds. Love it. Yeah, and if you know, uh, I can spin this, and instead of answering that question, uh, say that it would have been more interesting if he had asked what my shampoo was. Oh, okay. Fair. My shampoo is more interesting than my conditioner. Okay. So that was that was. I think the the audience's fault. Listen, that that that's something that didn't uh, didn't.
didn't quite make it through testing, but you know, now, <laughs> now we sort of have a better idea of the question that should have been asked. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. good to know. Um, so thank you everybody who sent in questions. Uh, really appreciate the interactions. Um, but MJ, I can't let you leave, uh, without asking you about my favorite leader, uh, in case you couldn't tell. Um, and that's Maul. Uh, oh, I didn't see that Maul back there. Uh, yeah, you I, know. I, at the beginning of this, I was like, oh, sick red light. That's cool. <laughs> I didn't even see why it's a red light. No, we, you know, we, uh, we gotta, we gotta make the red light in, uh, in honor of, uh, the best leader in the game, as we all know. Um, yeah, we have to cross ourselves. There we go. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, very excited for Maul, obviously. Can you just take us through how he came to be what he is, uh, in set three? Yeah, Maul stayed i think pretty close for a, a long time just as general giving overwhelm uh, i think tyler already said this somewhere or someone said this somewhere that his front side was also passive and that was very abusable with ambushers for a long time yeah um still leaving it on the deploy side was kind of fun as like uh here's here's an exciting dream you can get mm -hmm. um but yeah he he mostly looked a lot like he does now for all the time I saw him, except that for a lot of testing, he was a five deploy. Oh. Um, yeah. And we tried him at six once and were like pleasantly surprised. Like, Oh, this, this feels like it plays a little bit better. This, this feels like it's more right for him thematically as well. You know, this is a, this is a beefier unit. Mm. Um, and then when we were doing stat lines, we like jokingly put six six on him, and then we're like, "This actually seems fair." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a lot of excited yelling on the chat when we were like, uh, "It's it's also exciting, you know." Uh, jokes aside, because we oftentimes really heavily uh, HP weight the stat lines of our leader units. Mm -hmm um but you know maul is kind of evidence that we can do that in ways that aren't always going to struggle the way ig88 did you know um it's it's something that i am more on the bandwagon than i think some of the other designers but thinking about like what's the highest power we can print on seven deploy leaders right like what's going to be acceptable or feel fragile and unfun at all these different stat lines is, is kind of a fun space to explore. And I think Maul was op the guy that opened the gate on that, you know? Well, I, I personally love Maul's stat line and very excited to get all the things I need to play with Maul, but just hy hypothetically speaking, right? What do you think it's gonna take to win the Galactic Championship with a Maul deck? I'm just, I'm asking for a friend, you know, it's definitely not me who's going to devote the rest of uh, the time between now and July to figuring this out. Just, you know, maybe just one little nugget of advice would be helpful. Uh, well, you know, I, I've, I've talked a, a good bit about, you know, hoping and expecting for kind of different metas to come in and out. I think that Maul can play a really strong mid-range game in a way that when we're talking about five deploy leaders being able to play both sides, a side effect of him being a high power stat at six deploy is that he can't do it quite as well, but he can still be a pretty aggressive top end for, you know, a, a deck that is stopping at six, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so my expectation is that the best Premier Mall decks would probably be ones that are going to be able to play both sides a little bit in that way, you know, via sideboarding and, and resourcing to both take advantage of his overwhelm to kind of riskily try to outpace aggro decks, but to still keep enough of that, you know, bottom end to be able to adapt the deck and your resourcing decisions to still put a lot of fast, um, resilient threats on the board. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. But <laughs> but but that would be that would be my expectation. Yeah, I'm just you know, just taking some notes yeah. here. No, no worries. Uh, nothing to see here. Um, if you if you attack your opponent with a double bladed lightsaber in real life, 
uh, that may also help. Generally speaking, um, but then yes. may swiftly get kicked out of the tournament um, if that happens. Yeah, I uh, recommend it. It's okay, a, it's fun. Great. <laughs> that's another way to that's another way to lose spectacularly, as you were talking about in Twin Suns, right? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 To feel the to feel something again, getting kicked out of the tournament. <laughs> yes, to feel that's something. what we want everyone to experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, definitely excited for the future of Maul. Um, let's look ahead to the future of Star Wars Unlimited, right? Um, yeah. You know, we 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 talk a little bit about this. Uh, previously in in terms of getting our favorite characters in multiple aspects you know we've already seen some of that in this set count dooku uh sabine mm -hmm. ren you know the aforementioned molly we see darth maul uh now um so there's a lot of that that's been you know already seen throughout the first three sets and so what are some of the challenges that that y'all face uh when you're looking to release a new version of an iconic character and how it fits into the game in its new aspect and making it different from the old one. Yeah, this is this is like a, a surprisingly stickier problem than I think it first makes itself out to be, right? Uh, there's a, the obvious weights of like, you know, have we revisited this character often enough or too often? You know, do we have a, a acceptably uh, diverse lineup of leaders? Um, but the thing that has really caught me, especially as we go deeper and deeper into the card pool, is, you know, do we want leaders to favor certain aspects more as part of a way of defining their identity? Or is it important that, you know, we've already done a blue one of that. We want to do multiple other colors before we come back and do another blue one. Uh, and another question that's kind of, uh like umbrellaed under that which is that you know we have cards that we kind of intend to work with leaders sometimes explicitly sometimes implicitly if those cards don't work with some other iterations of that leader is that variety or is that annoying right like if we did another kylo ren and it didn't really care about the the two cost three two kylo ren's uh fighter or whatever the red villain card will casual people expect it to and then be annoyed you know um and so not just thinking about how much do we want to focus leaders around aspects there's also kind of this open question that has different answers for every leader i think but it's still very much a thing up in the air right now as we kind of are in this stage of the development of the lifetime of the game is what do we it, what if any mechanical through lines and synergies do we want or not want on those leaders? Um, that's a question that will get you very different answers from different designers. Sure. So you know, it kind of depends on a set by set basis. Awesome. Well, I and, and you know, sort of tying into that, you said something very interesting uh, in a previous article on StarWarsUnlimited.com, and I want to quote you um, because you said, "If there's anything in Star Wars that you love." and want to see in the game, I can almost guarantee that we love it and want to see it in the game too. So how do you feel that you and the design team have continued to carry that almost guarantee uh, forward as we move into Twilight of the Republic and, and beyond that? Yeah, uh, some of it, you know, is, is less present in part because the first year of Star Wars Unlimited, I think, is really trying to establish a baseline, right? Uh, each of the three sets are hitting very different parts of Star Wars. And there's a lot of characters like popular, you know, I this is our first Obi-Wan leader, right? Uh, you know, some people were probably wanted that from the outset. And, and so we have this more urgent pressing need of wanting to get to all these things that people expect and want out of any Star Wars game. Mm. Um, there's definitely been things like having Aphra in the game that, you know, are more, I think, acts of passion but the exciting thing about year two and onwards is that as we lay foundation we get a little bit more room to be a little bit more weird uh i just submitted you know like a, a leader list to someone for like a potential future thing and was thrilled that they weren't angry <laughs> it's always a good start like, yeah yeah i was like is this too weird they're like no <laughs> i was shocked i was genuinely shocked uh, so, so, you know, trying to push the boundaries and see where the edges of the envelope are, so to speak, uh, we're 
we're always advocating for stuff like that. You know, it's it's other people having to rein us in, being like, you can't do this or no one's going to know it's even a Star Wars game. <laughs> I love uh, that. Well, so again, yeah, I said on a stream semi recently, I I poke Tyler like every four months to put Delta Squad in the game, and I will continue doing so until it happens. So, <laughs> Tyler, come on, Tyler, get on it. Let's yeah. go. We should we, I, I, yeah, I should I should be good to just call out just just him and no one else so that people blame blame him specifically. Just, if you could go on Twitter and do that, yeah, yeah. just blame Tyler. It's yeah. you know that's yeah that's yeah. the answer. It's. That's, it's definitely not that sometimes they don't fit thematically in a thing. It's it's just his fault. No, the, <laughs> solely Tyler's decision. So let's yes. let's make sure everybody writes that down. Uh, blame him mercilessly. Yeah, but but if the, but if there are weird leaders coming, uh, then that's then that's MJ's responsibility. So that's oh, there's other people. Yeah. That, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, we all have our weird thing. We're a rainbow of weird Star Wars fandom. Well, speaking of speaking of your uh you know more or less responsibility you you took the lead in designing jump to light speed which is you know set four of star wars yeah. that's releasing in march um i know we're we're just about to hit the official release of twilight republic so i i don't want you to give anything away that you don't want to or aren't allowed to and i don't want to get too far into it because we still have so much time to yeah. play with yeah. twilight republic but what is something that that, that fans uh, of the game can be really excited about uh when when you're first set set four drops yeah uh there's at least one space unit in the set great <laughs> that's good to say that it's a good start yeah yeah some of the parts of set four are, are fun and funny because there's stuff in there that people have you know i've talked to people and they've expected or asked for like where is x or y i'm like it's coming you know we're gonna do these things there's other things i think people really will not expect and set for this is such a tautological answer it's like there, there are things people expect and also things people don't um but i think the things that people do expect are going to be really exciting and satisfying and i think some of the surprises that are in there are are pretty weird um and kind of out of left field in a way that hopefully will also give it a bit of kick i know one thing that's exciting for me a lot is that uh, jump to light speed pretty weirdly affects a lot of different formats. Um, I think it has a. I said this in the interview for like the the first uh, the first spark of rebellion is that is that Sep four has a kind of one of a kind limited environment that's really cool, and I think it also introduces a lot of of uh, interesting new strategies that diversify what it means to look at a meta beyond just the aggro to control spectrum. Uh, in terms of premier gameplay. And so those are those are things I'm really excited to see people talk about as they start coming to light. And I'm also excited that we're not talking about it too much right now. Yeah, because, no. as you said, absolutely that would not. be exhausting. <laughs> no, that's we got we have plenty of time to worry about set four, but in the meantime, set three is upon us. We're all really yeah. excited for it. And we've been really excited uh to talk to you, MJ. Thank you so much again for taking the time. This has been a blast um you you know you we glad we we finally got to uh to uh to get the chance to to meet sort of face to face um and we'll have yeah. to uh we'll have to compare knights of the old republic notes uh at a future date <laughs> yeah i'm down uh. whatever next convention or whatever we'll meet at galactics we'll both get there yeah I I guess that would be not allowed for me, but I'll make up a pseudonym or something. Love it. Yeah, we'll 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 play we'll play in a designer duel and just spend the whole time talking about uh, why Vsauce Mar is the best character, and we'll go from that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thanks again, MJ, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, this is uh, this is it for us, uh, but we will uh, we'll be back with more videos down the line. In the meantime, you know, if you have any uh, anything that you loved about what MJ was talking about or any additional questions that maybe MJ can scroll through and, and get a chuckle out of when, uh, when they're watching this video back, uh, yeah. go, go please ahead. entertain me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and uh, drop those in the comments below and uh, thanks all for tuning in. Take care.